And this panel is entitled Bridging Science and Policy, the Perspective of Future Cooperation on Air Pollution in the Region. So before we get started, please allow me to introduce our panelists and commentators once again, who will not have presentations per se, but will offer key insights, uh, provocations, and updates for us. So today's panel includes Dr. Fan Meng, Deputy Director General of the Asia Center for Air Pollution Research. We also have Professor Young Sun Vu, Vice President from the International Union of Air Pollution Prevention and Environmental Protection Association. We also have Dr. Supat Wangwan Watana, Senior Instructor of the Faculty of Public Health, Thammasat University of Thailand. And we also have Dr. Bjorn Peterson, Executive Director of Clean Air Asia. And in addition, last and not least for sure, is Dr. Qingfeng Zhong, Chief of the World Development and Food Security Thematic Group and OIC and Chief of the Environment Thematic Group at the Asian Development Bank. We're also, of course, fortunate to have our additional commentators joining us who always already had the pleasure to hear from in the opening keynotes, Dr. Marcus Aman, as well as Dr. Hajime Akimoto. So kindly note, if you're just joining us recently, the format for today is interactive and we'll be taking the questions in the chat box. At the end of the session, we'll have some space for these comments and questions. But let us go ahead and get started. And I would first like to kick off with a simple question for our panel. And that would be, what are the advantages of bringing, bridging science and policy in the air management, air pollution management space? And what are the gaps and opportunities? So let us first hear briefly in maybe just a minute or so from Dr. Supat, followed by Professor Sanwu, then Mr. Pedersen, Dr. Zhang, and Dr. Meng. Over to you, Dr. Supat, in just a few minutes for each. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Katin, uh, for a good introduction as well. Uh, I believe that uh, in developing the uh, management program for air quality, including the, the establishment of, of any clean air uh, action plan or whatever, we need to have the uh, scientific information to support, uh, to, to set up the proper policies to address the problem. If we do not really have the scientific information, we might go to the wrong way. Uh, we might address the wrong sources uh, instead of controlling the the uh, major source of pollution, we might go to the wrong way to to take a lot of measure to control source which are uh, are not so important, and and then we will not be able to really improve the quality of the air. Uh, we need such an a scientific information, the assessment, the uh, emission inventory and so on and also including the uh, information on the effect of air pollution as well and all of this has to be fed into the process of the policy development uh, in order to come up with the science-based policies i think this is the most uh, important thing uh, in in the air in any air quality management program and even in Thailand at the moment, uh, we are having such a, a process as well. The National uh, Research uh, uh, Council of, of Thailand uh, has uh, established a funding mechanism uh, to address PM 2.5 in, in Thailand and for several years already. And, and financial mechanism funding being provided to university to look for uh, the scientific information on, on air pollution. And that is actually used as a basis uh, for the Thai government to establish the plan and also to, to uh, change or modify the plan in the future in order to come up with the proper management of air quality. And I think this is uh, the way I see uh, for bringing scientific community to the decision maker or policy development. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing the, the examples of 
of Thailand and specifically th uh, examples such as the emissions inventory. I would like next to uh, invite Professor Sun Wu if you'd like to share as well um, any of the advantages of bridging science and policy in the air pollution management, as well as any gaps or opportunities as well. Sure. Um, thanks, Courtney. Um, first of all, I guess I have to make a correction. I did submit my um, correction to the, uh, the office, but I don't think it probably got all the way to you. Um, I'm the director general of IUAPA and not the vice president at this moment, so I just want to make that clear. Um, bridging uh, science and policy, that's always a question that we, you know, always you know, struggle with as scientists. Um, having to make the policymakers listen to what we have to say in a very understanding manner. Um, we are very, it's very certain now that air pollution especially is based on science, must be based on science. Policy must be based on science. We've made too many mistakes in the past. Um, everybody's familiar with the textbook um, cases of um, Southeast United States where we didn't consider the um, natural um, BOCs. Uh, even Japan had some miscues with their ozone problem. I even look at the ozone hole problem and say that, you know, there are things that we must um, base on science. And one of the things I um, struggled with when I first came over to Korea after my studies and um, started consulting with our Ministry of Environment is the fact that many of the people in our government, Ministry of Environment, considered air pollution to be the most difficult sector. I mean, taking nothing away from water pollution or um, soil pollution and all that, but air pollution, they said it was always the most difficult to tackle. So when they came to the air pollution division, they always found it the most difficult to try to work um, with that. Um, the concept of nonlinearity, um, this thing where, you know, it's not always you take away the emissions and the concentrations will linearly decrease. And that's not the case. And we know that a very, um, very well right now. So these kind of um, issues that we need to deal with in air pollution must be communicated properly. And um, uh, Marcus actually talked about this, but I think the most important thing uh, we as scientists need to um, upgrade a little bit is the fact that we are very lacking in communicating what we know to the policymakers, to the public. Um, we have to do a better job of the communications and sometimes we always talk about this and then do nothing about it okay um, scientists are enamored with this um pollution problem air pollution is a fascinating subject area and we like to you know research it and really delve into it but then when we get the results and try to um pass on the information to the public or to the um, policymakers we just don't do a very good job i think we um the summary report that was um talked about earlier in this um, section one is a very good step forward. I mean, these kind of reports um, that are, you know, very communicable and um, use very basic language to communicate what we learn for, you know, the first 20 years of ENET, I think it's a very great um, step forward in um, doing a good job with the communications. Wonderful. Thank you for highlighting not only the opportunity to, to reconsider how uh, information is expressed and communicated. I think that was part of the key message of what you're sharing. You know, we have to be data-driven, science-based at the same time, the art of uh, articulating and making sure that gets into the to the right spaces with decision makers, but then also highlighting the summary, right? The, the communication that's just come out. Um, thank you for that. So a little bit on the how. And next I'd like to invite Mr. Peterson to share some of uh, your thoughts as well. Over to you. Thank you, Courtney. Um, for me, the advantages are actually relatively straightforward um, in so far that, that, at least in my opinion, policies supported by science deliver impact. And that is in reality why we're all here. We are here to reduce air pollution. And it was noted by, by previous speakers, if we don't have policies supported by science, we might end up trying to control the sources that do not necessarily contribute in magnitude to the problem. Uh, so for us uh, to actually combat air pollution, we need authoritative, independent, credible, inclusive, and policy relevant scientific advice um, to implement solutions that control emissions. Uh, that is for me a, a key message because bridging the, the science and policy gap 
uh, will not only enable more timely action uh, or will enable timely action to minimize and prevent the adverse effect of air pollution. But I also think that science have not have also have a role in validating the solutions that we're putting in place. So not even coming forward with understanding and the problem, um, understanding then the size of effect of the problem, but also science have a role in evaluating and validating the solutions that's being put in place so that these best practices can be shared uh, through regional cooperation. So in my view, uh, it's extremely important to bridge the policy science gap. And I think science should actually extend not only to establish the, the, the magnitude of the air pollution problem, the sources, the scale of the problem, but also be part of validating the solutions that is being put in place subsequently to enable us to share best practices. And, and in your question, you also touched uh, upon gaps and opportunities. Uh, coming back from COP26, I think there is a, a opportunity uh, by connecting uh, the agenda of climate change, uh, air and public health uh, into a co-benefits agenda. I understand at this point that might not be fully part of the expanded scope, could be in stage four, but I think there is definitely a gap and an opportunity to, to connect these agendas um, to actually deliver the co-benefits and I think also cost effectiveness. I also think there is a gap and an opportunity, not only on country level, uh, but also looking at cities that in many ways are at the forefront of uh, working on air pollution and controlling air pollution, uh, while bridging the policy and science base on uh, regional level and on national level. This also needs to be brought down to city level to deliver what I mentioned in the beginning, the real impact and the benefits of bridging uh, the policy and science gap. Thank you. Great, thank you. I think you're opening uh, us up for more questions for you. I, I think it will be interesting to hear more later in the session about some examples of where this science can validate some of the solutions as well as city examples. Certainly with COP26, this was a huge element of the narrative around yeah. localizing and, and also to the point that uh, Professor Sunwu was sharing um, earlier as well, inclusive ways in which uh, this can be applied, this, this action, so to speak, can be applied um, among multiple tiers of society. Um, I would like now to invite Dr. Zhang to share some of the thoughts as well. So Dr. Zhang, over to you. Can you Can you hear me now? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you so much, I invite the IDB to attend this uh, very insightful uh, uh, discussions. Uh, from the IDB and uh, link the uh, science with the decision making and also the, uh, particularly the formulation of the, our lending programs is uh, very essential. I want to just take uh, two examples. One example is uh, IDB very deeply involved the preparation of uh, must plan for the uh, Beijing Tianjin Hebei air pollution control in PRC in China. And another one is uh, preparing uh, the must plan for uh, uh, Vranbato air quality management uh, uh, in Mongolia. Uh, again, you know, I fully agree with uh, those uh, views from uh, uh, our peer panel. They just discussed about that without knowing the uh, sources of the pollution is quite hard for us uh, to uh, I uh, put the right resources in the right place and the right time. Uh, just a very, very simple uh, example, like the Beijing Tianjin uh, Hebei, you know, the pollution in Beijing. Uh, you know, very beginning, uh, you know, this debate, why is the major sources is from the Beijing itself or the Be Hebei itself, where is the basically they came from the outside, you know, the what we, what we call is the greater Beijing Tianjin Hebei area, you know, Shandong province, Hulan province, Liaoning province, very beginning, we don't know, you know, is it really take it quite a long time to figure out, you know, this is a regional, this is a local produce the pollutants, or is it basically is a sort of the important pollutants, right? Uh, this is number one. Number two is a, among the different sectors, why is this a contribute more uh, 
by the uh, urban area more, or is they basically is they contribute by the uh, farmers, rural areas? You know, they are because they say, you know, farmers continue to combust the, the uh, rural, uh, their corporate juice, right? In the in the winter, particularly. That was the most uh, difficult season. Uh, the air pollution is uh, become high. Similar situation in the Mongolia also, uh, you know, we are uh, experiencing this uh, very difficult situation in the Vrambato, you know, they are, they, it was ranked the, the most polluted capital in the world. Actually, their situation probably different from the Beijing, uh, Jakarta, and also the New Delhi in terms of the uh, intensifications, but, you know, their the human health impact on uh, uh, children, this probably is the most severe. Uh, so when we look at the uh, situations, we see uh, the uh, scientific analysis identify the sources is very critical. But sometimes we also need to look at the uh, cost of benefit way. Cost of benefit way is not only just say uh, economic benefit. We also need to look at what the most significant the uh, human health benefit, for example, in Mongolia, right? So uh, which area we think is the congenerate the significant benefit we can help reduce the health impact. Uh, finally, you know, from the, our uh, investment perspective, we also look at what have the modality, you know, like uh, we, we, from the IDB side, we always are talking about, you know, policy-based loan. We're talking about financial intermediary loans. We're talking about you know the result-based loan. We're talking about you know the uh, the, the loan is more focused on technology transformations. Uh, which of the instrument is the most effective? I think this also involve scientific analysis. Uh, so uh, yeah, probably if you have the more questions, we can further discuss. So I again you know very very early stage when we involve the Beijing Tianjin Hebei. Uh, we number one is the focus on, on uh, formulation of the master plan, and then uh, we introduce is the first uh, policy based loan to change the policy to make uh, the uh, you know what the labeling conditions are ready for implementation of uh, master plan. Uh, the similar lesson, lesson we also adopt for the Mongolia as well. But when we move to the next stage, yeah, we we will focus more on uh, technology tra uh, transformation for. Uh, small medium enterprises, and then we will focus more on uh, whatever their financing mechanism we can introduce, enabling sustainable financing for uh, quality management. Probably let me just pause here. If you have any more questions, so we can uh, you know further discuss. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, and thanks for setting the scene, um, integrating some of the the conversation, of course, around the financing mechanisms, uh, how that interacts with policy. And then one thing that you also highlighted, you know, beyond that is, is the cost and not only economically, but also to the impact on, on health and children. Um, and even when you think about many um, cities around the world, but particularly in Asia at times, schools will be closed for, you know, maybe school and work sometimes, depending on the, the level of um, hazard uh, toxic air. So there's a whole nother factor in terms of uh, progress in, on the economy that you're touching on. And um, so, yes, let's explore further as well. And last but not least, we have Dr. Meng, who is invited to share some thoughts as well. So over to you, Dr. Meng. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, Mr. Uh, Zhang just mentioned the Beijing, uh, Tianjin, Hebei area. Uh, remind me about uh, my uh, experience uh, doing uh, research in the region. Yeah, actually, the, as many uh, uh, speaker already mentioned, uh, uh, air quality is uh, air pollution is a very complicated uh, uh, issues. Um, when, whenever we talking about uh, impact part, we're always talking about uh, uh, concentration. No matter if uh, it's a gas concentration, gas gas air pollution, or PM, or maybe in the precipitation for the asset deposition. So we're all talking about uh, the concentration. However, the reason of this uh, uh, concentration is um, or impact of air pollution is, um, is the emission. So whenever we, we want to control the problem, we have to go to the uh, emission, the emission sources. However, the emission sources and the concentration uh, uh, between uh, 
these two uh, issue, there is a, a big uh, gap or process, uh, which is a physical process like transport by the wind or diffusion by the uh, atmospheric uh, uh, turbulence and also the uh, uh, conversion, a uh, chemical, very, very complicated com uh, chemistry uh, uh, converts uh, the primary to the secondary. So this is a very uh, complicated issue. So scientists uh, or science, uh, uh, we solve this uh, problem. However, usually this uh, uh, funding or, or, or data uh, is a, uh, complicated for the uh, policymaker. So we, when, whenever we talk about uh, uh, research, usually it's uh, for the certain period of time or certain location or area and all certain air pollution, not, not all the air pollution, or even we only talk about uh, air pollution, but not uh, climate issue. So, but actually those uh, uh, issues are closely related. So, and the, on the other hand, the scientific funding and the scientific uh, uh, conclusion sometimes uh, not so 100% accurate. So maybe it's uh, misleading for the policymaker. And so that is why. So uh, we need a bridge between the scientific community and uh, the policymaker. That is uh, my, uh, my thoughts. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much for your thoughtful take. And I think it's a perfect segue uh, into some of the other questions and realms of what we would like to explore, which is also about we've identified some of the, the, the trends in terms of what we've just heard, key pieces of information and updates, but also some of the opportunities or gaps to be filled. So I would like to also add um, or ask, I should say, um, you know, given that there's a, a you know, we had the past 20 years with the head for the next 20 years, hopefully, um, a lot of strong work to be done. But in line with this, I would like to open up the floor and ask either Dr. Meng or Professor Sunwu or Dr. Supat, you know, what is the role of large networks like Ianet in this case and in other entities, but the communities of, of practice, the scientific communities, networks like Ianet, um, what ways shall these, what's the role in what way should um, you imagine this being really leveraged going forward. <clears throat> if anybody uh, would like to go first, please. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, have... maybe I go first. Huh? I think uh, first of all, I'd like to to congratulate. I'm very pleased to to hear that uh, yesterday the the Ianet IG intergovernmental meeting has actually decided to extend the scope of the internet uh, from from used to be uh, only acid the position and focused mainly on monitoring and the decision yesterday is actually opened the way uh, for future collaboration in the region uh, on air pollution since the, it, it actually uh, extend the scope of substance uh, to cover not only acid, acidic substance, but also some other air pollutant, uh, particularly uh, particulate matter and, and, and ozone. Uh, not, not, uh, and and uh, since it is the problem of the region, the assessment uh, on a regional basis found that uh, the PM problem is widespread over the Asia, Asian region, uh, not only in East Asia. Uh, so the expansion of the scope uh, to cover other air pollutants and also the activities, activities, uh, are not only focusing on monitoring, but uh, also doing some other uh, uh, assessment and, and also uh, some other thing uh, on the activity. That's a very great opportunity. Uh, since uh, there are other uh, networks as well uh, in the region, uh, for example, the Malay Declaration on, on Air Pollution in South Asia, 
and and uh, near spec uh, in the northern uh, northeast Asia and also some other uh, network in in the region. So I think this opened the way for internet uh, to go to, to which has uh, country in Asia, Asia, including Southeast Asia, where Thailand is located. Uh, to work together with uh, other network on air pollution, on air pollution. Uh, I think this is open the opportunity, the decision that has been made yesterday. Uh, and and uh, I think uh, it also opened the way to uh, collaborate with ASEAN country as well, because uh, among the 10 ASEAN country, uh, there are 10, eight of them already uh, participate in the end. Uh, so there, there will be an opportunity for UNED to also work uh, on on uh, air pollution with the ASEAN community. Uh, since, as you know, uh, ASEAN also has an, an legal binding uh, instrument as well. Uh, it's uh, the ASEAN uh, Agreement on Transparent Transboundary haze pollution. Uh, although the 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 agreement uh, is quite quite uh, limited scope, uh, focusing on on uh, particulate matter, and also focusing on uh, sources from from land fires and forest fires, mm. and and I think this this can be uh, an opportunity for for the internet to open the way to work with ASEAN and maybe ASEAN can explore uh, for the extension, uh, learning from internet, the extension of the scope of, of the agreement as well, uh, to cover a broader uh, uh, scope in terms of, of uh, substance and also in terms of activity as well. Yeah. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you. So yes, the expanded, um mandates to expand a scope creates can unlock a whole nother series of conversations and partnerships and collaborations um particularly as you mentioned with uh, transboundary uh qu air quality challenges uh, is certainly the way forward um i'd like to ask uh, professor sun Wu or dr uh, meng is there any additional thoughts that you had along these lines as well yeah uh may i yeah, um, I, I think the question is uh, uh, the role of a large uh, uh, network like a uh, ENET. So I think, uh, first of all, I like to uh, uh, face that uh, uh, ENET is really a large uh, network. We have uh, a 13 uh, country uh, involved and we uh, carrying a, a very large uh, geographic area. So from uh, uh, the cold uh, northern part to the tropic part. So uh, I think this uh, uh, means uh, uh, ENET, uh, we can uh, deal with uh, many issues, not only the local issue, but we can also uh, deal with the regional issue like uh, we already did uh, uh, for asset deposition. And we can also uh, involve in many uh, regional uh, problem uh, uh, including the, uh, uh, with uh, climate change. And uh, the other, uh, I think, uh, uh, for the uh, network like ENET is we have a, a benefit for uh, its a large network. So ENET could uh, access to the uh, more resources than a single country, than, than, than a, a, a local uh, city. So. We, we have what uh, we can access a very, it's a government uh, uh, corporation uh, 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 network center. So we can have a uh, resource inside and outside, including the, uh, the funding and, uh, and, uh, uh, and also uh, the in kind resource. And we can uh, promote uh, sharing uh, data, we can sharing the uh, model and analysis uh, tools. And we can share uh, human resources, and uh, more importantly, we can share the uh, knowledge and experience from uh, among this uh, country and also even outside country. So I think uh, it's a uh, 
very uh, important uh, for ENet. We we can play a very uh, important role for the uh, international cooperation. So I think this is uh, 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 one of uh, ENet is a strategy. So I, I think that is uh, my thought. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else want to chime in? Please feel welcome to. When we think about the expanded scope and opportunities and role of large networks. Yeah, um, I actually had started talking <laughs> before Dr. Uh, Meng, but uh, let me just continue. Um, and uh, if you give me a minute, I'd really like to congratulate um, all the organiza organizers of ENET on their 20th um, anniversary. And it's a great honor uh, to be joining this distinguished panel to talk about uh, future activities of ENET. Um, I was very excited to hear about the um, expanded scope, um, what um, you um, call the wider air pollution um, activities. Um, and I read in your um, statement of uh, focus statement that the aim of today would be part celebration, which is very important, um, part sharing, and part expectations and roles for a new ENET. Um, I don't know if this is exactly the point where I wanted to say this, but I would like to challenge the people who are involved in ENET um, with a, a statement that I'm about to say is that um, I really would like ENET to be more than what you mentioned um, and what you uh, concluded uh, in the past two days. I was hoping for something on the line of a Asian um, clartet, for example. Um, something, and I don't mean to focus on just um, long range transport. That's part of it, but I realize there are many sensitive issues along with that. So, um, but I still would be very interested in ENIT um, taking charge um, in this region to expand their scope, not just as a scientific body, but um, if you look at what EMAP and CLARETEP has done in Europe, to actually take charge of the entire um, region, their air pollution policies and cooperation. I'm very glad that Marcus Saman is with us um, right now because um, obviously he has been uh, participating in the European situation for a long time and his talk uh, touched on a lot of the points that I think um, uh, we would be and I would be very interested in. International support, um, the understanding, the science that is needed. And then uh, Marcus also talked a lot about cooperation. Um, we basically need a strong understanding in the science and knowledge department, and we will continue to do that. I know that ENET will be very active in trying to search for solutions um, in the scientific sector. But I, was, um, I would like to see more in the area of um, cooperation in the fact of like policies and what um, the maybe with a direction toward going toward like conventions and some um, uh, agreements and whatnot, and not just on a scientific field. Uh, the reason that I think ENIT is the um, best starting point is threefold. First, because of Japan. Obviously, Japan has been a leader in um, this area um, uh, in the air pollution field for such a long time. Um, and ENET, second, ENET has the most, there are a lot of um, organizations in East Asia that have international um, you know, connotations, but ENET is right now, as far as I know, the organization that has the most um, countries as its participants. So that's an advantage, right, to start off there. And um, this is not gonna be very popular in Korea where I'm stated, but uh, this um, opportunity for an expanding focus gives you the um, perfect timing to do something um, very significant. Um, two years ago, I attended the 40th anniversary of um, Clartet. And it's, I, I always find it so amazing that it's been already 40 years in Europe since they've been cooperating with the long range transport and also air pollution in general. And um, it's just a little frustrating for me to see that um, we don't have something similar in um, East Asia. And so I, I sort of um, throw this challenge out to um, uh, the people who are involved in ENET to maybe um, have a more stronger 
a more um, powerful focus on becoming a um, the Asian um, uh, EMAP or Claritat, and to even you know having a bigger um, what do you call it? ideal to try to um, solve the air pollution problem in East Asia. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Samu. And and actually, I'd like to kind of uh, build on what you've, what you've already introduced. So the call to action, to, uh, to be bold, to learn from um, existing examples that are doing things well. From your own vantage point as Director General of UAPA, uh, IUPA, sorry, um, you know, what are some of the things that, that are happening there that perhaps we could learn from, you know, could learn from, or things that are underway uh, that would be helpful for us to hear about today. Do you have any uh, examples you wouldn't mind sharing with us? Yeah, I, yeah. thank you um, for bringing that up. Um, a lot of your audience members probably don't know about IUIAPA, so if you'd um, allow me to just introduce it just a little bit. It's the International Union of Air Pollution Prevention and Environmental Protection Associations. It's basically a international organization of air pollution societies, national air pollution societies. And obviously it was based in Europe for, it was, well, actually it was founded um, in 1964. And we just moved the secretariat in 2020 um, to Seoul, Korea. And obviously there's a lot of interest. Um, one of the themes of this um, movement was the fact that air pollution is much um, a, more of a um, problem in Asia compared to Europe. Our society was getting kind of um, maybe um, stagnant, a little old, if you will. Uh, we are very um, uh, event centric, which is something that we want to start um, to change is that we are the organizers of the World Cleaner Congress, which used to be held every three years. Uh, we were trying to push that up because now three years is such a long time in this day and age. And we're trying to um, do it every two years. Uh, but this Corona business <laughs> sort of, you know, got in the way. But um, we had been an international forum for cleaner issues for a long time. Um, I believe that we coined the One Atmosphere um, slogan um, for the first time. Um, we also were um, active in the, uh, the maker, founders of the GAP Forum, the Global Air Pollution Forum. Uh, unfortunately, recently, um, there has been not much progress because of these kind of problems. And the fact that we are not very um, quick responders to um, this um, new pandemic problem. Um, but having moved the Secretariat to Korea, um, I am looking forward to um, participating in a lot of the regional issues here. Um, with respect to Ernet, um, Ernet and their new uh, expanding focus, we will hopefully, um, uh, IUPA will hopefully um, play a substantial role in the future. Thank you. Fantastic. That's great to hear. And also make sure that everyone that's tuning in is, is clear about uh, some of the great things that we can learn from uh, the AUPA experience. Um, I'd also like to ask Dr. Zhang uh, from the perspective of the ADB, you know, in, in terms of uh, providing, you know, solutions or support in solving the air pollution challenges, you know, how do you imagine um, collaboration? What does that look like or, uh, you know, being a part of the ENET uh, network? leveraging that this existing network as we've heard you know the the scope the reach the um the ability to also connect uh more locally through the different nodes of the network any thoughts around um that you don't mind sharing uh dr zeng can you hear me yes yeah so i i think two things i i think is a very critical for us uh Whenever we uh, start the uh, the our investment uh, in uh, uh, Asia Pacific, uh, you know the question they always receive is, uh, uh, "What experiences lesson will you learn from the past?" And of course, uh, we always uh, we will uh, you know have a meeting with our board members. Uh, uh, those board members will always encourage us to uh, uh, promote their south south learning. Uh, you know, one example I just say, uh, you know, we just conclude the uh, uh, COP26. Actually, we have the one event uh, as a sort of the takeaway from the COP26 and link the air quality management with the camp change. Uh, so, uh, 
one of the key uh, areas we look and uh, you know the we always say you know the win or lose uh, 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 can change is uh, going to uh, decide in Asia, right? Is uh, just talking about you know the China, India, and there was so uh, uh, Indonesia, for example. Uh, so uh, one of the key mechanism we just talking about, you know, the uh, knowledge sharing between the uh, New Delhi, Beijing, and also Jakarta. I think uh, when we're talking about the cooperation with the uh, 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 ELAT, I think uh, 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 so much group, uh, you know, the big group uh, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to discuss uh, the possible cooperation. Number one is a uh, sort of the link the uh, science uh, uh, and also the uh, decision making, also mobilize the resources. Second is uh, uh, also about the technology. One of the key initiatives that uh, Luella ADB just launched in uh, COP26, we call it the energy transition mechanism. The energy transition mechanism is very much tar target the most uh, biggest uh, difficulty, uh, difficult sources of uh, air pollution, that is the thermal power plant. So because we're talking about, you know, a face out, uh, the face down coal, right? And then the uh, thermal power plant is the target. But how to face out? It's quite hard, right? So I, from the IDB and the uh, team up with a number of the investment bank, uh, we are talking about acquisite, you know, the uh, the uh, the old or existing uh, uh, thermal power plant, and then have the professional management to help manage and operate it for 15 years. Uh, during the process, and also started to uh, gradually replace this type of the sources by the renewable energy. And after 15 years, we just uh, terminate this thermal power plant. So this is sort of uh, uses a financial uh, modality, financial tool, combined with the technology transformations to address the approach management. Right now, we have uh, two countries sung up uh, already in the Southeast Asia. Uh, one is uh, Indonesia, one is the Philippines, right? So I think uh, we hope more country can sign up you, because at the end of the day, you know, COP26, uh, you know, the, uh, so many countries already have the page, you, uh, you know, face down, you know, the coal, and then the energy transition is the top one. And then this is a significantly core benefit. So I think uh, if we're talking about the cooperation with the ELI, I think uh, through this uh, technology transformation, through the uh, link to the science and decision making, through the, uh, you know, even for this Kenya Asia, you know, actually the Kenya Asia, you know, is uh, something like, you know, IDB and the World Bank jointly established in 2001. We're happy right now as the Kenya Asia now, they have the Beijing office, have the New Delhi office, is uh, quite effective already. We hope this type of the office can, can be replicated to other cities. You know, you just look at this uh, one article from the uh, Times a few months ago, 99 of uh, 100 uh, most polluted cities in the world is in Asia, right? Jakarta is the top one, right? It's the most vulnerable city. But really, we don't have the office in the Indonesia, in, 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 uh, in, in Jakarta. We need to have the one. Uh, and then they are promote this type of the knowledge sharing. We know the government has awareness. And we, and we know the government willing to take action on the air pollution management. Uh, I think uh, uh, Light or the Kenya Asia, IDB and many other organizations can uh, make contributions. So IDB also are ready to work with the, one of the DMCs and also the, uh, one of the you know, scientific research institutes and also uh, like the Kenya Asia, many others you know, to, to help our countries. Probably let me pause here, thank you. Uh, it was a brilliant and, and a perfect segue as well as to um, where we would like to also ask Mr. Peterson for his words with Clean Air Asia too, but thank you for sharing as well, you know, about the, the energy transition mechanism and then other uh, elements, you know, on the radar in regards to what ADB is intending to do, is doing. Um, and so let's turn to Mr. Peterson, if you don't mind, um, sharing a little bit more of your perspective in regards to some of the latest things that are happening, um, you know, from your vantage point, but then also what does the collaboration with Ian uh, in the near future, actually, what does that look like? How do you see that? Over to you. Thank you. And um, I should start by saying I'm also very honored to be here uh, and, and to be part of this uh, milestone in, in Ianet's 
history um, from from a Clean Air Asia point of view um, and a little bit back to the previous question about how we see uh, ENet developing uh, I think there is a a void at a regional level that ENet has the potential to fulfill I think that is uh, clear and we stand ready at Clean Air Asia to collaborate uh, with ENet both in the short term as well as under the expanded scope. Um, we have a number of programs in, in Clean Air Asia focusing on on emission standards for coal-fired power plants, transport and, and broad uh, science-based uh, air quality management and uh, climate action plans on city level. And I uh, have been working uh, more than more than 200 cities across Asia um, over the past five years in strengthening their capacities. And one, one of the areas where I see clear opportunities for collaboration between Clean Air Asia and where we stand ready to help is through our um, program, our IBAQ program, our program on, on integrated air quality supported by uh, Minister of Environment in Japan where we have since 2014 uh, been working uh, with ACAP and IGES uh, in building the capacity um, of both local as well as national uh, officials in science-based air quality management. Uh, we're into a new phase where we are now focusing on really expanding our capacity building offer and I was quite pleased to see that as part of the expanded scope, we are going to see capacity building and communication uh, and we would be uh, more than happy to extend that and, and I think we can build uh, on the strong foundation that we already have in terms of collaboration with, with ACAP and UNEP, UNEP as, as well. Um, so uh, we stand, stand ready to do that and including also on, on the communication and information side all the way back to the beginning of this, um, this discussion when it was highlighted that there is a significant need to also be able to communicate uh, the science and the solutions uh, but also by itself communicate the expanded scope of ENET where we as uh, IUPA also have a number of events uh, across the region where we could build uh, this in. I see also um, where we can be of assistance to uh, and, and support ENET uh, could also be in terms of having a reach beyond governments into civil society. Um, we talked also about the need for inclusive implementation of inclusive solutions. Uh, Clean Air Asia has just completed a, a three-day learning series on uh, inclusive solutions uh, for city level action, working with uh, citizens and marginalized groups within cities, which has been proven to be extremely effective in implementing uh, targeted control measures on uh, city level. And we would, again, be happy to bring that approach to ENET on the implementation side of solutions. Uh, and I can even highlight with examples, for instance, from Quezon City in Philippines, as, as well as Ogo in Indonesia, where we are quite progress now in delivering uh, technical assistance to these cities that are sign based including data emission inventories roadmaps uh, control measures and putting financing mechanisms in place so there is scope for also implementation so to conclude on on how we see our relation with the internet um, we have been working quite closely with moej with igis with acab in the past um, we will certainly continue to do so and we will make sure that we bring our resources to the table and be of assistance as much as we possible can. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Peterson. And sharing as well, you know, some of the technical things that uh, are advantages of, of working with uh, Cleaner Asia as well, including the, the capacity building, the 
the already on the ground, um, you know, interactions that you're having at the, the local level, the ambition and intent to be inclusive and bridging uh, across society beyond government as well. Um, so really, really wonderful to hear of what's what's there. And of course, I think the theme across this panel is the ambition is raising. So what are we going to do to to meet that? And I'd like to actually ask Dr. Meng, who you know among our panelists is representing the ENET. Um, so Dr. Meng, what's kind of strategies you know is ENET developing? And I know there's already been previous meetings in the past few days, but if you could elaborate um, for for you know in a synthesis of sorts um, of things that are happening for the future in terms of tackling. Of course, uh, acid deposition, but also air pollution, and and then also based on the responses from the co-panelists, you know, how could Yenet be better prepared for future challenges and work with various partners as well? So it's over to you, uh, Dr. Meng. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, actually, uh, uh, regarding the strategy of uh, Yenet, is a, a, a too big uh, a topic for me. I, I just I, I involved in ENet uh, activity for some years, but I just joined ENet a few weeks. I I, I cannot uh, say this is a uh, uh, reflecting the uh, uh, ENet uh, uh, opinion. It's my own uh, opinion. So I think first of all, uh, uh, Asia country as well as uh, ENet uh, we are facing a uh, challenge. Uh, uh, the most uh, important is that as uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Akimoto mentioned, uh, so we uh, the countries, uh, 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 country of ENET is at uh, a different stage of, uh, in terms of uh, economic development, as well as uh, uh, their uh, energy consumption structure, uh, and uh, also the type of uh, pollution and uh, uh, atmospheric environment issue uh, uh, problem uh, facing. So it's a very uh, quite a big challenge for uh, ENET, and uh, uh, ENET is as an organization have de developing uh, successfully, I say, uh, developed for the twenty years, and uh, they have their own uh, strategy, which is uh, uh, demonstrate uh, successful for at least for the uh, at, uh, asset position uh, monitoring and other uh, activities is quite uh, successful uh, for me. And uh, as mentioned uh, in uh, prior speech, and also uh, uh, mentioned, the ENet just uh, expanded the uh, scope. Um, so, um, for strategy as uh, developing uh, development strategy of ENet, I think first of all, so ENet should be uh, uh, keep uh, uh, strengthening its uh, uh, capacity. Uh, including the monitoring capacity and also other uh, scientific research capacity. And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, very uh, important for the ENET as a, a scientific uh, uh, research uh, network. And uh, secondly, I think uh, I've mentioned uh, in the uh, uh, main uh, uh, talk as uh, uh, Dr. Aman and uh, uh, Professor uh, Sam Wu mentioned uh, the ENET should play more uh, uh, important roles uh, between the scientific community and uh, the policy maker. I think this is a, uh, it's a very important uh, strategy for the uh, ENF to develop. And thirdly, I think uh, ENF should uh, uh, develop a strong uh, relationship with uh, uh, international cooperation uh, with the other international organizations like uh, uh, CAA, like uh, IASA, APB, IUPA, uh, etc., and as well as uh, university and uh, uh, research institutes uh, uh, among the participant country and outside the ENET. I think uh, uh, which is uh, uh, important. And uh, finally, I think uh, uh, organization and uh, coordination of uh, ENET should be strengthened, uh, including the, uh, the network center should be uh, strengthened and as well as uh, our funding uh, uh, or budget mechanism, we have, we have a, 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 a change or, or, or improved, more flexible and to, uh, uh, to have, uh, to utilize uh, external funding and other uh, funding source. So that is, um, that is my uh, uh, quick thought about uh, mm -hmm. ENET. Uh, <coughs> 
Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. And lots of opportunity, right, to, to build and expand the scope and, and also activities, as you were mentioning. Mm -hmm. So um, what a uh, rich conversation at this point. Does someone really want to come in? I think I heard someone's yeah, voice. Yeah, I, Go ahead, I, please. Um, Kati, may I? Uh, I'd like to yes. add to the point uh, that Dr. Sun Wu mentioned uh, that Yenet could pay, play a major role in the region. Uh, and I, I also would like to see what uh, Dr. Sun Wu mentioned as well, a kind of, of uh, convention or whatever, uh, ASEAN or Asian convention on Asian air pollution or something like this, similar to LERTEP. And the, the internet could play a major role on that because it is uh, its large network of, of country. Uh, and and I, I was part of the establishment of internet back in 2001 when I was with the Pollution Control Department uh, of Thailand, uh, representing the Thai government. Uh, and and I also used to be the, the coordinator of the uh, internet secretary for for four years for four years exactly and and during that time uh the internet ig meeting always every time invited uh other network to come to the ig meeting to to present what the other network uh, are do, doing for example the malay declaration uh the new aspect including the UNECE or the TAP secretary as well, been invited to share their, their experience and their work uh, as well. Uh, it's always happened like that. And this could be continued. And the opportunity is here because uh, the, the secretariat of UNED uh, currently is housed in the regional office for Asia and the Pacific of the UN environment in Bangkok, offices in Bangkok. And and uh, the UN environment office in Bangkok uh, in the past couple of years has hosted what is called joint forum, joint forum uh, to bring to bring all the network in Asia to come to the same platform, to the same forum. Uh, I think the objective is trying to have collaboration among the network uh, in Asia on evolution. And I think the aim is how to uh, come up with an integrated network for the Asia and the Pacific region. And I, I hope uh, that, that the internet uh, will, all, will continue to play, play such a role together with the uh, UN environment and, and especially the UN environment already has the resolution on air pollution. So that is the advantage uh, uh, for to make things happen in Asian region. Yeah, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And, and what a tremendous amount of um, wealth and experience you bring to the table as well for us to, to learn from and build upon. Um, extremely rich conversations happening and we're not even close to being finished. So I'm sure there's even more uh, on this amazing panel to tap into, but I'd like to also invite our commentators for any kind of inputs, uh, you know, building on these themes, Dr. Iman and Dr. Akimoto, um, in regards to just what you're seeing, the key actions in the region um, to, to really build a strong and integrated collaboration to the, to the language that Dr. Supat was just using. Um, and any kind of suggestions or ways in which you imagine and can see that you know, expanding its reach and scope. Um, so with, if with our two keynote speakers from before, if either of you would like to, to chime in and, and share a little bit of your point of view, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Maybe Dr. Uh, Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> no, I just wanted to pass on to, to uh, talk to Kimoto first, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> oh, whichever. <laughs> Should I? Okay, I was, oh. <clears throat> okay. Um, as for the uh, future ENET activity, I'm just uh, in mind uh, something very specific one is, uh, for example, <clears throat> ozone issue 
Now it's uh, very serious in China, and in Japan it's a little bit uh, alleviated. But the, I heard the Korea still have the ozone problem as well. And uh, but the ozone issue, how to control the NOx and VOC, that kind of uh, issue has already been uh, more, more than 40 years, nearly 50 years history. So the um, when I started my atmospheric chemistry work by Professor Jim Pitts in 1970s. At that time, already uh, some discussion which should be controlled by NOx or VOC. And such kind of discussion has been still be there. And recently in, in China, the NOx has been decreasing, but the and, and PM2.5 is also decreasing, but ozone is increasing. And also the very recent uh, COVID-19 issue and the NOx has decreased, emission of NOx has much decreased, concentration of NOx also decreased. But then in urban area, the ozone increased and in rural area, ozone decreased, something like that. And so those kind of basic thing is already known. And some, so some people says the ozone chemistry or ozone atmospheric chemistry is not very new, They're not very interesting anymore. It's already known. But uh, in the practical world or the real policy <coughs> related world, it never ends. And in China, it's now a very serious uh, discussion now. And in I, 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 and in the Thailand, in Bangkok area, is also have a ozone issue. So <coughs> if we uh, have a some sort of a working group or something to very much focused on some subject like in this is just an example but it's all those on and then there are good uh, science scientists in japan korea china and uh, also uh, maybe in thailand they have some experience of his own country's uh, data but uh, the ozone issues should be un uh, resolved more, what they say, uh, universally. So the um, Japanese uh, ozone chemists should be also interested in the uh, in Bangkok's, uh, Bangkok not, and Beijing issue. Why, why it's different from Tokyo and why it's different from Seoul, something like that. <clears throat> and those, if we, uh, and this, this, there must be something new Otherwise, uh, scientists uh, are not interested in to be uh, to discuss together. But uh, as far as the uh, ozone issue is there, I think something new to be to have to be solved. So, if we uh, like us, there's some collaboration of the real good scientists, of expertise of each, of each countries get together under the ENET, then they have uh, some good progress of the collaboration uh, and there's some new aspect of uh, ENET to, to be worthwhile for policymakers. <coughs> That's the uh, kind of thing I just uh, uh, can come to my mind. Okay, this uh, <laughs> I'll stop here now. Thank you, Dr. Akimoto. And Dr. Man, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe two short observations. Uh, the first one, uh, after uh, conveying my congratulations, <clears throat> might uh, formulate uh, some wishes for the future or uh, recommendations or think some directions. And there were so many important things were mentioned just before, and I really agree to all of them. And this is really extremely thoughtful and important. I just want to pick out one uh, is the question of who are the actors and it is this it, uh, at the moment ENET is very much focusing on this long range transport which which has uh, traditionally has a notion of being transboundary this is partly true but there's this other dimension that this long range transport also applies to cities and and regions within the same country which is maybe less contentious uh, but equally important, and especially in many 
not in all, but in still, unfortunately, in many countries, in many cities in Asia, air quality management is still seen as an urban issue, which I think we have clear understanding that when we look at least at PM and also for ozone, it is not a, a local issue, it is a, a regional issue, maybe not reaching out to the other country, to other countries, but to the surrounding areas. Now, to convince the actors at these levels to think about beyond their own boundaries, uh, we, the le one lesson to learn is that a shared knowledge base, scientific knowledge base is useful. And in principle, the information is there, but the information, scientific information is not everywhere. So there are many places, some countries, but also cities where this information is not known. And I think it would be valuable if, if uh, EARNET could start the process of, you know, building this or the extending the scientific community beyond these academics who are currently working on this issue, but also bringing in people from cities, from maybe regions, subnational regions and scientists to whom the local decision makers are listening. We have a similar process currently going on in Europe when we can share experience. Mm -hmm. It's not so easy, but I think it is absolutely necessary to get towards uh, a more effective use of re economic resources that this information is shared also to those who have to take action. And there's this issue, you know, who are the actors at the urban scale? That's the one thing. And very briefly, the second one is, uh, because Akimoto has imp mentioned the importance of uh, also ozone, but also secondary particles. And for secondary particles, we understand from the scientific side that ammonia emissions are very important. Uh, Dr. Professor Akimoto has pointed this out very, out very nicely. So, but again, this is an knowledge which is not widely shared and not widely distributed among the decision makers. And the important implication of the importance of ammonia and, uh, and all is that for tackling uh, the ammonia precursor, one has to think about and talk to the agricultural community, which is always a challenge. At least in Europe, it, was a, it still is a major challenge, but it can succeed. Mm -hmm. uh, it is important. But along this, some of the arguments which were brought before, it offers the opportunity for major co-benefits if for reforms of the agricultural sectors. When there are major development benefits, if you know, one uh, farmers would switch to a more efficient use of fertilizers, avoid over fertilization, economic benefits, social benefits, benefits to water and so on. And I think we need, so what is important is that there is a kind of a champion who is emphasizing this perspective. And I think it is, would be natural for EONET to also go into this direction and raise the awareness about the importance of ammonia uh, emissions of about the agricultural sector and bring the agricultural sector into uh, a more efficient air quality management. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, uh, both Dr. Akimoto and Dr. Aman. I'd like to just uh, remind the audience, if you have any questions, you are more than welcome to, to share them in the, the chat box. Um, at the same time, we, you know, we still have a little bit of time to enjoy the, the wisdom of the crowd of the panel. And we hear a lot about, um, there's a lot of content, right? There's reports, um, for example, we, we hear about the we haven't heard in detail, but there are, for example, uh, Dr. Meng is the, the chair for the periodic reports on the state of acid deposition in East Asia. So there's things that are, you know, knowledge documents that are produced, but what I'm also hearing in terms of a theme, you know, is how does uh, the network really take it to the next level in terms of the, how it's engaging with and collaborating with other partners and actors, um, cities, governments, civic society, um, you know, across that spectrum. I'd like to ask, uh, everybody actually on the panel, if you had any kind of key, um, you know, maybe it's a, a best practice from your organization or something that you've observed happening elsewhere that's really notable, that would be really fantastic for um, the ENET uh, to consider as something to aspire towards doing either more of or perhaps trying to do differently. Does anybody want to try to tackle that one? So this is about strategies of engagements, um, tools, 
and ways in which uh, collaboration can be strengthened. Yes, um, I have a very short comment um, on that. And um, we've talked a lot about, including myself, about communicating um, our results and solutions to the public. Um, I know a lot of scientists are not very um, keen on the, uh, on like events and um, uh, what do you call it, staged things. But um, we have now a um, UN approved um, International Day of Clean Air for Blue Skies, which is September 7th um, every year. Um, I think, um, you know, not only ENET, but um, the participating countries of ENET and um, all the respective scientists that are um, listening to this program, um, these kind of, it's actually um, very important that we have a day where we can concentrate on clean air, um, try to um, convey what we are doing right now and convey the importance of that to the public. Um, having organizations like ENET having special um, programs to, um, that are done during that day or, or, or that week, um, like for example, um, uh, uh, APCAP, it has like a clean air week where um, they have certain events and stuff. And mostly it's um, academic and international um, conferences and stuff, but uh, involving the public also. I think, you know, it ha giving that kind of a day, um, having the media more involved and in trying to um, disperse the public that we are doing a lot for clean air, um, how it's very important to you health-wise and so forth. I know in Korea, they, um, the media is really centered around air pollution these days because of our PM problem that has been um, with us for a long time. But I know that a lot of the other countries that um, the education of the public has not been that um, advanced yet. And using these kind of opportunities, I think um, to communicate to the public will be um, also very um, important. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so leveraging these, these these rallying points that can that can occur to engage multiple different parts of uh, society, and and noting and highlighting Clean Air Day, which we did have an event, um, but then as you said, some taking it to the next level, in Clean Air Week, for example. Anybody else would like to to chime in? I'm sure all of you have something to add in this space, uh, contributing in regards to ways we could do things even better. Maybe I can add a few thoughts. Please. Um, in, in terms of, of collaboration and, and reach, um, I think we also, I guess, needs to be careful that, that ENET should not up, end up being everything to everybody. Uh, that might be a little bit of, of <laughs> overstretch. Um, what I think in, in terms of reach and collaboration is tapping into the very rich ecosystem that we have out there already. Um, and, and you ask for examples. Um, I can talk about my work on city level where we have reached together with C40 and ECLE, um, working with cities uh, across Asia, including actually in most of the participating countries. and. I think there's a unique opportunity uh, for us to bring that reach in. Uh, I guess what I'm saying, rather than the internet starting to communicate uh, what they're doing, we'd be happy to help with that communication because we do have the reach to cities, we have, do have the reach to other organizations, we do have the social media channels to do all this. Uh, so I guess that's back to my original point about us standing ready to help. I think uh, internet uh, have a fantastic potential future ahead of uh, them. I would love uh, maybe sort of chiming in a little bit on the vision side. Uh, my dream is to see a, a 21st, 2030 vision for clean air maybe coming out of an intergovernmental body down the line, which was maybe a little bit what Marcos alluded to as well. Um, but in the meantime, uh, everything is not built in one day. Uh, under the current scope as well as the, the future scope, I think there's an extensive opportunity for 
collaboration in terms of reaching out to partners. And I think there's a number of organizations out there in the ecosystem um, that could help with doing so. Um, and you know, so have our special role in that the ecosystem. Uh, we're not the one reaching governments as much, um, but more reaching uh, the practitioners uh, and sometimes academics as well as cities, etc. Um, so that would be my take of the opportunities for for collaboration and reach. And I think we we should really help Ianet build that reach and we stand ready again to, to do so and, and try and communicate that science. We do that already around Clean Air Day, World Environment Day, etc. Wonderful. Last... Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Pedest uh, Mr. Peterson. I, I would like to see uh, perhaps Dr. Supat, would you like to chime in? Um, having had the experience I've already been within in it quite significantly, but also based at an academic center with Samasat University and having already worked with government too. Do you see any kind of new opportunities on the horizon for how to engage quite strategically moving forward? Uh, I think we have to, uh, for, for the internet, if, if uh, it seems that we, we are looking at internet to play a major role uh, in, in the region, but we have to understand as well that the internet is under the the control of the government of the participating country so we need to work with all the participating countries if we want the internet to have such a direction and and from my experience working with the internet uh, everything has to be consensus so uh, it might be uh, a, a long future to see what will happen in the region. Uh, so uh, I think the most important thing is to work with the country, all the country, the 13 uh, participating countries of the United States, to come to the same point of view. Uh, and then the internet will then move forward uh, on that point. Uh, if not, then then it would be very difficult. And and when when you look at uh, the development of, of the expansion of the scope of the internet, it's already twenty years yeah, so far <laughs> that we come to this point. Yeah. And 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 uh, uh, in order to get out the agreement from all the participating countries, uh, so. In order to to uh, move forward, uh, I think we need to work with all the the government of all participating countries in the region uh, of of the internet. Um, otherwise, it will be difficult to move ahead. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Any any uh, strategies from your experience uh, in terms of building that harmony? Um, it seems that uh, for sure, as you mentioned, when you're talking about this, where it's housed, the units, um, and having that kind of um, consensus oriented approach. If you had anything else to share on that, please feel welcomed. Um, and I'd also like to extend the, the question to Dr. Zhang and Dr. Meng before we move on to our, our wrapping up of the panel today. So if anyone wants to continue uh, to expand on that, that would be fantastic. I think the, the UN environment already plays such a role you know, in order to talk to uh, government in, in the region. Uh, for example, the, uh, in September this year, uh, the UNEP, uh, also, uh, UN, UN environment in Bangkok has also organized a clean air week under uh, the APCAP joint forum. And I think INET, uh, INET also was invited to be part of the joint forum as well. Uh, so such an effort already been taken uh, by the UN environment. And, and, and I think the UN environment should also continue to work with the country one by one in order 
to to bring bring a, a consensus for the unit to move forward. Wonderful. And uh, Dr. Meng or Dr. Zhang? Dr. Meng first. Yeah, he's the owner of this uh, organization, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I don't have a much to 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 add. So yeah, I don't have much to to say right now. So I think uh, it's uh, as uh, uh, Doctor uh, Supa mentioned, it's uh, twenty years. So and right now it's a uh, time for us to think about the uh, future, and uh, we discuss a lot of uh, uh, things here and a lot of possibility and uh, I think it's a uh, yeah it's time to to think about how to make uh, things happen yeah that's what, what I saw uh, like I'd like to add to uh, the, the issue of Oson mentioned by uh, Professor Kimoto uh, Oson Oson uh, level in in Thailand also uh, rising so in the past couple of years and, and I think we, we have uh, recognized this problem quite some time already. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the past, uh, when I was with the pollution control uh, department, we conducted a study uh, related to ozone formation. And, and in, in fact, we found that uh, uh, VOC is actually the controlling substance of the ozone formation in Bangkok. So we spent a lot of effort effort uh, to reduce uh, hydrocarbon emission from uh, transport sector uh, quite quite successfully uh, and uh, not very much effort being made on NOx emission so far and so we still see some uh, slightly increasing uh, NOx uh, concentration and with that we see uh, also rising also concentration but but what happened is that if we do not do anything uh, on on VOC emission from from uh, transport sector also level might be even higher than what's happening today uh, because we have gone uh, from 2 million vehicle in Bangkok to right now uh, more than 11 million in Bangkok so, so, but, but I have tried to raise an ocean issue in Thailand for for many years already, but not very successfully uh, to to attract the interest of, of the government uh, because I left the government already. So <laughs> I, I have raised this issue for many years, but uh, public still focus mainly on PM two point five issues because they see it by that a bare eye every every season uh, but but also on seem not to be uh, very attractive to to the public so far but but i i will still keep trying to do that uh, to raise the issue of also and 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 i think in the near future uh, thailand will have to address this issue seriously uh, after the pm 255 and what we found also we we saw we see actually the second peak of ozone in the evening. In the evening, most of the time we see the first peak uh, in in late afternoon, about one to two o'clock. But uh, then it is going down. But by the end of the day, uh, in the evening, uh, it rises again. The level of ozone, and and I think that uh, indicate some kind of transport of ozone from uh, other areas into into the, the Bangkok area as well. So so there are still a lot of things to do uh, with the ozone issue. And the secondary particle, as Marcus uh, mentioned as well, because we found that uh, almost uh, 15 to 20 percent of particulate of PM 2.5 uh, in, in Bangkok actually uh, uh, Secondary particle. Yeah. Well, thank so you for. Yeah, go ahead, please. 
<laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, I can do out of the power already. So I think uh, I quickly share two uh, points. Uh, number one is a, 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 a Yila uh, has, has done uh, such a great job in the, the last 20 years, you need to uh, build up. Uh, I think uh, the opportunity now is uh, again you to go back to uh, our uh, head of the Kenya Asia, your know, Dr. Bara just uh, say, you know, this uh, link uh, the uh, 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 quality management with the uh, camp change uses the opportunity of the COP26 as, as a, a key driver to help uh, uh, expand the, the possible cooperation. Uh, uh, this is uh, number one. Number two, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, again, you know, when we see the importance of the uh, scientific analysis to the decision making, but same time we also see the complications of the scientific uh, analysis. Uh, you know, they were talking about the uh, two, uh, PM 2.5 uh, logs and they're talking about this uh, uh, VOC, many of the possible pollutants. Uh, again, you know, they are, when we come to uh, the stage when I, you know, Beijing Tianjin Hebei air pollution, you know, the uh, one of the key season we debate where you know the uh, uh, to to reduce the air pollution if there's a weather, you know, the broom, you know, the, the wind will become more important. Or we our effort to reduce the pollutant is more important. Or is a sort of the issues is come from the natural natural induced or is it the human induced? Is it still the debate? You know, the uh, but you know, one, one, one uh, very, very clear indicator, you know, particularly after the pandemic, I quickly share the, uh, the indicator here. During the uh, COVID uh, lockdowns, I call the index in New Delhi dropped it by 45%. And then in Beijing, Tianyi, Hebei, in PRC, uh, nitrogen uh, dioxide levels dropped by as much as uh, 54%. So again, you know, this is a, very clear indicator say their proteins is uh, mostly human induced. Is that, you know, there's a way that may, may, may play a very important role, but you know, this, uh, you know, human activities, uh, you know, may be important. So I think if I, 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 I said, uh, you know, yeah, let you guys can uh, quickly summarize the key lessons, you know, from this, uh, particularly during the pandemic, how these things uh, uh, change, and then probably we also provide the guidance for how we can build uh, uh, better forward. So probably let me pause here. Uh, I know, uh, you know probably in the next few minutes, uh, my power is out, you know, and uh, we're going to disappear. So I, I quickly to share these two points. Over to you, Chair. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Zhang, for sharing uh, before the power is out. And uh, in the spirit of wrapping up our really uh, incredible panel where we covered a wide uh, array of different topics and uh, threads, both of the challenges, but also the opportunities. Just wanted to see if anyone had any final remarks or closing key message um, before we wrap today's uh, panel completely. So the floor is open if anyone else has final thoughts. Yeah, let me just uh, make a very short comment. Um, during Dr. Azuma's um, presentation, uh, he mentioned the fact that uh, the SLCPs, black carbon and uh, methane, uh, would be excluded because they would be they were considered more to be climate um, problems than air pollution problems. Um, I would like um, the organizers of the unit to maybe uh, reconsider that point. And I, I understand uh, Marcus's comment about having to be everything for everybody. I mean, you know, you can't treat too much, and I understand that. But it's my firm belief that uh, when we treat air pollution. Um, climate has to be in there. I mean, you can't think of it separately anymore. So I think it's a good segue to actually include uh, SLCPs because you can always think about climate on the side at least. Um, another way to look at that is the fact that um, for certain countries, um, finances uh, for this kind of uh, work might be um, aided if climate was part of the situation. Um, a lot of the countries, um, everything is now going to climate and the air pollution um, budgets are shrinking by the um, every year. And um, to have a connection with climate, I think would also help the financial situation. So that's something to consider. And um, again, I, I realize that it's, you know, treating too much can be very difficult, <clears throat> also, but um, please just make it a consideration. Thank you. 
Great. Fantastic. Thanks for that key point on narrative as well and uh, the specifics. Any final other contributions from anyone else? I'm a very polite panel. Well, I'll say that that's uh, silence is an indicator. Uh, oh, OK, I see a hand raised. Yes, please go ahead, Dr. Meng. Yeah, not, not, not to wrap up, I just uh, uh, add one point. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there is a big difference among the countries, especially uh, a lot of uh, people talking about here. So it's a uh, different uh, uh, pollution issues. But uh, I think uh, uh, e uh, what ENET can can do is uh, to actually is, uh, to help uh, a different country. So like uh, Japan, Korea, and China, we have a, a so-called su successful uh, 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 story. Uh, like China already uh, uh, reduced uh, uh, emission. Actually, the uh, sulfur dioxide is gone. And PM is uh, under control. And uh, uh, but uh, uh, for the other countries, uh, the issue is still there. So I think uh, ENET maybe can help those uh, countries to share their uh, uh, experience and also maybe uh, share the, uh, the lesson we learned. And I think uh, uh, that is uh, one point. The other is uh, uh, for the ENET, we are uh, monitoring a uh, network and also doing uh, other uh, research activity. And in many countries, uh, actually, uh, uh, to my knowledge, the, the, the data and the information of a science is uh, a knowledge is uh, still uh, behind the, the policy. So that is, uh, I think, uh, ENET can help here.